Um, I gave this talk a couple years ago here, and I've done it at New York and uh, New Jersey, a couple places. And just, uh, just a little bit of a background. When I started my veterinary career about 25 years ago, there was no such thing as aftercare. It just didn't happen. And the way that I got involved, the mic went. Oh, yeah? The way I got involved was um, there was a young woman who was having bake sales for horses just to try to save one or two horses off the track. And that's kind of how it started. And that, that young lady was named Lori Lane, and she ended up um, being largely responsible for rerun in New Jersey. And that's kind of how things got started. And now here we are, 25 years later, and aftercare is a mainstream topic, and it's part of the business plan for racing. I'm so happy to see that. And so now we're kind of moving into the next stage and just trying to get everybody on the same page and educate people to how we can make this whole process better for the horses and for really all of racing because um, we all win in that scenario. So just going to give you a little bit of a talk here about the aftercare situation, where we are now, and how we can best avoid the one last race syndrome, which is what we call it, uh, just do a better job for us and for the horses. And I'm going to give you a bit, give you a little bit of background in the beginning as to why that's kind of important. So, first of all, why am I here? Naturally, I'm an, uh, a veterinarian, and by nature, we you know love animals. And I think I could say that pretty much about everyone in this room is in it because they love horses. You don't do what you do every day, spend the time and the time away from your family and the you know, poor pay and all the things that go along with working with horses if you don't love them. So I'm an equine vet. I, I, you know, I specialize in surgical and medical care of horses, but I just love them. But the other reason why I'm here and really why all of us should be here is I'm a business owner and I rely on racing. So 99% of what I do revolves around racehorses. My practice is located in New Jersey, but we have about 17 race racetracks within a three or four hour drive of the of the clinic, so if racing does well, you know I'm going to see a lot of patients, and um, so I was concerned as a business owner about the business plan for racing and where that would leave me. So for all of us in this room, we all rely on racing, being healthy and doing well in order for us to succeed. As a kid, Ruffian was the real impetus for me to become a veterinarian, and we can all remember what happened to Ruffian. I was 10 years old, and that just made a huge impression on me and made me want to try to do something to help horses. So that's how I got started. So I think we can all agree that there's a huge partnership between horses and humans in racing, and that's something that we need to capitalize more on and show the public, but you know, just, just, this is just a glimpse of some of the pictures that we all see daily. Uh, the gentleman on the upper left is a man named Roger Hammer, and he won the Hamiltonian at like 70 years of age. He drove the horse himself. He bred it. I mean, it was a huge, huge co uh, companionship issue there. And up on the right, that's Dr. Dean Richardson with Barbaro. We all remember the story of Barbaro and how it just captivated the world, really, and the, the relationship between not only the, the owners and the trainer with Barbaro, but Dr. Richardson himself. And so the little guy on the left there on the bottom, that's Smarty Jones. That was another story that just captivated the world. So there's just so many stories in racing about the relationship between people and the horses. So what is the role of the horse in our society? I mean, nobody in here, I think, is old enough to remember when horses were really the backbone of a community. And so an agrarian society is one in which the community was relying on agriculture for their livelihood. So we don't necessarily have that as a role for the horse anymore. There's such a reduction in rural settings and we depend less and less on agriculture. So the question is, are horses livestock anymore, livestock, or are they companion animals? And this is where we really need to become aware of what the public thinks. I think we all kind of grew up thinking animals like such as cows, horses, pigs, they're all livestock. But if you try to take the temperature in the room of most of the, you know, the clientele that comes to the races anymore, it's not really thought of that way. Horses more of companion animals. So that's really important for us to understand as far as where horses fit in in today's world. Of course, we have many, many things that horses can do. Uh, they're performance animals, multitude of disciplines. We see them all over the world doing things. They're service animals. Every year, the Standard Bread Retirement Foundation 
distributes a number of horses to local police forces that they use uh, in the cities, and they're fantastic um, urban law enforcement animals. Border patrol, of course, pleasure, and racing. So that's where we come in. There's multiple breeds, standard breds, Arabians, thoroughbreds, quarter horses. So that's the role that we're talking about today in, in our uh, business. So racing today in the U U.S., kind of where are we at? If you just looked at the number of races um, in 2021, it was 33,567. That's actually an increase from 2020, but it's a big decrease from 10 years ago. So we all feel it with the shorter fields and the less number of conditions written and all. We can tell that there's definitely a, uh, a decline in the number of races run every year because there's a decline in the product, a decline in the horses. We still remain in the U.S. as the third in the world in the most money bet annually, and it's a huge number. It's $11 billion with a B. So that's gigantic. So that's a big con contribution to the economy of this, this country. And there's also a crucial far-reaching impact that people forget about, the secondary, primary, secondary, tertiary aspects of horses. Small businesses, you know, just as a hay, hay and feed supplier, the farmer, um, tax shops, et cetera, open space. Uh, my clinic is on a 300-acre farm that's open space. That farm wouldn't be there if we weren't there. Same thing for horse farms. It provides a lot to our community. Tax revenue, of course, even just the, the number of trucks that we receive up and down the New Jersey Turnpike is quite a bit in tax revenue for, the, for our state. So there's a, a number, number of benefits that horse racing provides aside from the obvious. But we're still struggling for relevance in the world. So, um, you know, there, we're not the only form of legalized gambling anymore. If any of you follow harness racing, you'll know that Pompano Racetrack, which has been in business in, since 1965, I think, in Florida, just had its last night of racing uh, Sunday night. And they're closed because of the decoupling that occurred in Florida between the racinos, you know, casino gambling and racing. So. We're struggling for our relevance. We're not the only form of gambling anymore, so we have some issues with that. And also our customer demographic is really shifting. The older patrons that used to sit you know, on the track side there, they're diminishing, and the younger crowd is not entirely interested in what we're doing. It can be a complicated form of gambling, you know, all the trying to read a program. You hear people talk about that. So this is an interesting st statistic from 2011, but the jockey club had said we were losing 4% of our, our, you know, our fan base every year. That was in 2011. So how much have we lost since then, if it's a 4% rate? So a part of that is, too, that we're not really um, able to sustain racing so much anymore as a business model for people. We're evolving more back into a sport or a form of entertainment. And with that comes different responsibilities than if you just had it as a business. We see a lot of our ratings for TVs going up in some of our marquee events. Um, certainly Handle is way up on some of those events. But the business as usual model of racing is not really attractive to the demographic that we'd like to, to attract. So these kids or younger adults are not raised in an agrarian society. They're not agriculturally based. Horses weren't part of their life growing up. And welfare issues are critical. And this is where we come in to this point that we're at right now. The racing fan of today is not this guy anymore, like the Walter Matthau guy that you would see at the racetrack. So they're very tech savvy, they're very impatient, they want to be entertained, they want a fast paced, uh, you know, fast paced type of gambling product. They have so many opportunities to do things and they're very concerned about animal welfare. So to a lot of people, they won't even look at a race because of animal welfare issues. So we need to get over that hump to even get somebody into the door. Breakdown injuries, you know, we've had a lot of high profile stories about that. That's been a big problem. Uh, drug use, of course, the aftercare issue, and then slaughter was a really big issue for people that whenever you spoke to them about, about racing. In 2006, I actually went to Congress and I testified for a slaughter uh, bill. I, to me, it was like a no-brainer, but I didn't realize at the time racing and people in my profession weren't exactly ready for that. And um, 
you know, they were still of the mindset that horses were of a livestock type of uh, commodity. So that didn't go over so well. And um, here we are, you know, 20 something, 20, 15 years later, still fighting the same fight. So it's a big, big deal to, to the average person. Look at all the people that are at a NASCAR show. They're not really worried about a horse breaking down. So. So when you're talking about racing welfare issues and the public perception, it's really important that you understand who your audience is. And so the recent generation of the fans are really different. They're really just concerned about the horses. You know, they enjoy, they can enjoy a race if they feel like the horses are enjoying it or, or being taken well care, you know, well cared for. There's a word here called anthropomorphism. We should know what it is. I hope all, all of you have an idea, but that's where people apply human emotions or characteristics to an animal. You see it all over social media, you know, when they, they feel the dogs, cats, everything has an emotion or emotes some kind of human feeling. That's what people think. So anthropomorphism is very important that we understand when people are talking about racing, they want to know if the horse is happy racing. Does a horse feel excited, nervous, abused? Those are the kind of questions that the average person is asking. And also the impact of the internet is really important. Um, things that used to be dirty little secrets, for instance, are no longer secret. We see it all the time. Um, somebody's always got a camera, and a lot of times it's accurate or it's taken out of context. But there's a continuous news cycle, and this, the power of social media is very real. You know, there's a lot of positive effects. This allowed us to promote racing and some of the stars of racing very easily. Um, you know, trainers and access of the general public to some marquee events, but some very negative and detrimental effects. You know, there's a, a breakdown issue, drugs, welfare issues, and the slaughter thing it comes up all the time. Social media, Facebook, Instagram, anything like that um, can have a very negative effect on any business, but particularly on racing. So I would ask you to look at this slide as, as a general member of the public, not as a horseman. So you have these two horses here. They're both three-year-old thoroughbred colts. They're both very attractive, very successful, well-mannered. They're both owned and trained by very reputable people. They both have won a number of stake races and over a million dollars each. The thing is, the one up on top had stallion value. The one at the bottom did not. The one at the top is Smarty Jones, and he went on to have a stallion career. The one at the bottom ended up in a slaughterhouse. So this is what a general public person looks at. And they say to you as a horseman, well, what's the difference? They feel the horse earned its keep, earned its money. How could it possibly end up that way? And that's a tough question for us to answer. So racing and the slaughter issue really has become more and more of a big deal. Um, because racehorses are named, they're not numbered, they have personalities, they have fan clubs, they have lots of media attention when they're famous. Um, we need to learn from previous fatal mistakes. I'm, I'm, has anyone here ever been to a Greyhound track? I have, um, and it was kind of fun, but there's not too many around anymore. And so they've been whittled away, mostly because of animal welfare issues for no other reason. They had business, but they had very negative welfare um, perceptions. So they're pretty much gone. We need to know who our adversaries and our revealers are. And by revealers, I mean people that really wanna show what's going on in our, our business, whether it's um, in the right context or out of context, but to try to, with the agenda of ending horse racing. So it's really important that you know, know who your enemies are and educate them. So we're going to, what we really are getting to is what is the one last race syndrome? And that's just something we've all in the aftercare industry have kind of coined as we've um, you know, come to this point where we actually have options for horses. And that's where a situation where we have a chronic physical problem that is now entering the danger zone. Everyone loses in that scenario, not just the horse. Everyone loses, the track, the industry, the, the horsemen, the connections, everybody. So we wanna to try to eliminate that possibility or lessen that possibility just through education now. We don't wanna end up with cases here on the right. These horses are not competitive. They're not gonna do very well for you. 
and they're at risk for having something happen that's potentially fatal or catastrophic to not only the horse, but the jockey or anybody else in the race, and just very, very poor public's perception. So when somebody from out of the racetrack asks you, why do racehorses break their legs? These are some of the answers that you fi might find yourself saying. They stepped in a hole on the track. They took a bad step. That's commonly even still printed in lots of media reports. Horse took a bad step. They're full of drugs. That's really untrue, but it still is a perception issue that's out there. And the track is bad. There is some, of all four things, the track is bad, it, there is some value to that because we do know that track conditions can make vulnerable horses more susceptible to a breakdown. We you know, all remember what happened at Santa Anita and also uh, a number of years ago at Aqueduct in the winter meet. It was definitely related to some track conditions that made vulnerable horses more susceptible. But these are all incorrect. That's not why horses break their legs. We know this now through science that almost every fracture we see is a stress fracture. It's something that happens as a result of training and the way the bone is adapting to that training and remodeling. So it's a natural response to training. Bone remodels in, in response to the force that's applied to it. But are we doing it the right way? Are we doing it too little, too, mu too much? Do we allow too long a period of rest and not enough time for the bone to retrain? So we, we know all this through science that it's a stress remodeling phenomenon and that's when horses break their legs. So this is a really technical slide but it's really simple to show you. This is just like a tiny, tiny sliver of a bone under a microscope. It shows you, if you just look at what an untrained bone is on the left, I don't have the greatest pointer here, but, oops. We have some music, it's nice. <laughs> uh, the one on the left is an untrained bone. It's like a sponge with lots of little holes in it. It's very, you know, it's spongy actually. It's got a lot of give to it. When you train the bone in, in the B section, uh, we start to get some density there, right? The bone's filling in. It's getting harder in response to what you're asking it to do so it can handle things. But when you rest that horse, even just for a few weeks, bone is so dynamic, it keeps working, and it starts uh, reabsorbing itself. So it doesn't need to be as strong because it's resting, so it takes back some of its bone that it's already laid down. This can put the horse in a vulnerable state. You all might have heard of a case where, say, a horse was training fine when it was laid up for a few weeks for a foot abscess. And then it goes back to training and then fractures a sesamoid. Well, out of the blue. Well, it's probably something related to this. On the right, we get a, a, a sense of a horse that's been trained a lot. It has a very dense bone, but it's become somewhat brittle, and it starts to crack up towards the top. That's how stress fractures occur. So, for all you metalheads in the audience, if you don't really understand that part, just think of it like, you know, as if you were a lughead. So think of joints like ball bearings. They need to be smooth, they need to work properly, but they eventually get cyclic fatigue from doing the same thing over and over and over again. So then you finally have a failure of the smooth gliding surface. That's just like a joint. Or if you get like a little bit of a chip in the joint, just like you would get a little bit of like a crack in your ball bearing, you change the structure then and the gliding motion of that joint and you get a, a problem starts occurring. So that could be a result of conformation, shoeing changes, training habits, or, or the pressures of year-round racing. You know, we used to have meets and horses would race for a meet and then be off for the winter or be off for a few months. That doesn't happen that much anymore. So think of it that way, it's just they're not machines, but if they were a machine, it would be like that, a ball bearing that kind of gives out over time. So the fetlock, that's the place where we see most of the injuries. It's the most common site of the injury we see in a thoroughbred racehorse. So these are just a collection of a few things you would see, condylar fractures, sesamoid fractures, P1 fractures, suspensory injuries. All those things are stress related. They accumulate stress in the bone over time and then finally, you know, another factor intervenes and they crack it. It's very susceptible, this joint, to progressive arthritis. It's where we see the most attrition 
uh, for thoroughbreds being lost is the ankle. So subchondral bone disease, you might have heard that term, or bone bruising. This is the biggest problem we see in fetlock joints. And it's actually a, a training phenomenon, but over time leads to full-blown erosion or car of cartilage or craters at the bottom of the cannon bone. You know, when you see a horse that's four or five years old, they have these little craters then that you get at the bottom of their cannon bone, and they're very sore, they don't flex very well. That is a result of the stress remodeling that's occurred since they were two years of age. They're very risky for a catastrophic injury. This is what they look like at the bottom of their cannon bone on the half shell. Um, but it also really decreases their chance for a second career. When we get horses that are this far along, they can't do a lot. They're very lame, or they get a condylar fracture. And one of the hardest things for me is um, I'll get a nice two-year-old in from Belmont Park, you know, just has a simple ankle chip or something. Very simple, high dollar horse, the owners do the right thing, the horse gets the chip removed and goes on. Then I see it later, and when it's five years old, and it's running for 5,000 at parks, and we get it in, it just doesn't look the same, and its ankles are shot, and it has these big holes in the bottom of its ankles. That's really, for me, the hardest thing about the type of business that I'm in. It's really hard to see that. And it's, it's just being used. It's a man-made phenomenon, and they're just getting used up. So we want to try to stop that before they get to that point where they can't do anything else. This is just uh, another view of what you might see. It's the end result of chronic wear and tear. And so you see in the back of the ankle that you get this, my quote pointer doesn't really work, but you see where it's circled there, you get this little um, hole that occurs. And here's it on both sides of the cannon bone here, these holes are craters. This is just something that happens over time, and it's a, a, the end result of what you would call bone bruising. And then this, I get this very commonly. But I don't understand. The x-rays were normal, but it might be because we're not looking in the right place. So any thoroughbred older than two years of age is susceptible to this issue, whether in one form or another, whether you see it as bone bruising or you actually get full-blown holes or a crack. But the radiographs of an ankle, if you're going to have your veterinarian radiograph the ankle, you, you need to ask for the flexed AP view. We, we say it a million times. Can you just send me the flexed AP view? If I had to go to a desert island with just one radiograph of a fetlock of, an, of a thoroughbred racehorse, it would be this view. And it just shows you where all the pathology occurs. It's at the bottom of the cannon bone. I'll show you an example. This is an AP, or a straight-on view of an ankle. It looks pretty normal. But with the flexed AP view, look what you would have missed. This horse is getting a condylar fracture. You can all see this line right there. So they're getting a condylar fracture. Another breeze or work or, or a race would get a full-blown condylar fracture, which would completely change the prognosis than the horse has right now. So just by getting the proper diagnostics, the pr proper views, makes a difference. Here's another example here. This is a, a condylar fracture. This was a two-year-old at Saratoga. One is made and raced by like 10 or 12 lengths. Connections were very excited. It was a very expensive horse. And the veterinarian called it in as a, it's just a simple condylar fracture. The owner and the trainer are standing at the, the x-ray at the shed row, say, oh, it's real simple. You'll be fine, just a screw or two, and it's gonna be normal. But we get the horse in, and we take the flexed AP view. And look at the difference. So this is a two-year-old, and so it had a fracture, but it had eroded the whole bottom of his cannon bone, a hole there. So it's a lot different to call the owner than say, this is a retirement case, this horse will never run again, we're going to fix it, but, you know, it's extremely disappointing. But had you, that view been taken, perhaps before even the horse had run in the race, you would see that pathology is happening there. So this horse ended up being a stallion, but it was very disappointing. But just having the right views makes a huge difference. So you probably wonder, why do we take chips out of joints? Certainly not to make tons of money for surgeons and you know, just give us something to do. Um, we actually take chips out of joints because we want to minimize the arthritis that occurs when chips are present and give the horse a longer career and help it perform better. So that's really the reason that we take them out. So 
I'll show you an example here. This is what a normal uh, arthroscopic view looks like in an ankle that has a small chip. So what we're looking at is just the cannon bone is on the left, and on the right is the top of P1, and that's a small chip. So this is a two-year-old, had some joint effusion, the connections immediately x-rayed, stopped, and they want to take it out. So that's what it looks like. And as you, what you can notice there is that all the white part is cartilage. It looks really smooth. It looks good. That's a simple ankle chip, and that's why we take them out early. The next one, this is a horse that was about a work or two away from racing. They didn't want to stop, so the chip was the same. But now look what's happened. We have all this like arthritis occurring. So you see the lines that are forming in the normally white surface of the cartilage. So just running on something like that increases the arthritis, which is a progressive issue. So it's gonna continue to progress even after we take the chip out. And then this one is one that they didn't take out <clears throat> until like three or four months had gone by. And so then it's really not worth taking out the chip, really, because the chip is not the problem anymore. It's the arthritis. So the horse's career has been decreased and also gives it less chance to do something with them afterwards. That's what it looks like after, but the joint's a mess there. So that's why we take chips out, to limit the arthritis that occurs. So when you look at this, you say, which chip should be removed from this joint? Is it this one? This is obviously the front chip up there, big chip. That's what it looks like arthroscopically. Or this one, you can barely see in the front of P1 there that there's a chip. But that's what it looks like inside. This is the kind that's the tough one if you don't remove it. This boulder that's in there, you see how smooth it is? It doesn't have any fragments. That one is probably fine for the horse. This one is not. These are the subtle ones that are hard. They release all this bone debris. It's like getting little pebbles in your shoe, and it just grinds the joint up. So the subtle radiograph is the one that is actually the one to worry about. Sometimes that diagnosis can be hard. The clinical signs are usually very, very standard. They get joint effusion after a work. They have pain on flexion. Or they have, may have some lameness just transiently. But don't think that the radiographs are always normal. Sometimes they can give you a negative, especially two-year-olds. They don't make big pieces. They make tiny little fragments. So even ultrasound has helped us a lot in that, that um, situation to actually confirm the diagnosis and treat the horse. This one here, just wanted to show you. This is a two-year-old that you can hardly see a chip has this clinical signs, but there's a subtlety up there of the joint surface that just looks like fragmented, a little bit crumbly. And this is what you find arthroscopically. You go in, the joint looks perfect, but there's that little bruised area there. But when you probe it, that's what comes out. So that's with another work or another race, that would be released and just chew up that nice white cartilage. So this way, the horse was the pieces were removed, the horse was fine, they're back in work in six weeks, and the joint remains normal. This is just another example of, this is a large chip, but see all the little tiny pieces associated with it in the front? Those are the ones to worry about, and that's what it ended up doing to the joint. So the horse ran at it a few times and developed these little bit of crumbles, and it just was released into the joint. So really lessens the you know, the ability of the horse, the longevity of its career, and the ability to do something else later. How about knees? We all see knees, right? The two joints, though, are very different. You might have heard the very, you know, general term that upper joints do better with chips, and that's true because they make a different kind of chip, and it's a different kind of motion. The upper joint is kind of like your elbow. It's like a hinge joint. But the lower joint here has a big table surface, and it's a real weight-bearing bone, weight-bearing joint. So generally, yes, upper joint chips are much more favorable because of the type of chip that they make. Lower joint injuries, though, tend to be more of very cumulative stress problems. So it's not just the chip that they have, but other issues going on in that joint. Here's an example of an upper knee chip. 
looks really big. You know, people say, oh my gosh, this chip's so giant, how's this horse gonna come back? Actually, they're fine. The size doesn't matter here, it's just um, the location makes a big chip like that. But that's what they look like on the inside. So taking them out, really long, the horse's career is, is um, lengthened and they're usually pain-free, they usually do very, very well. You just take them out when they freshly happen. As opposed to a lower joint, this may look so much smaller, but they tend to do this over time. So the bone here gets really dark and bruised, and it sheds little fragments. And actually, we have some fragments in the back of the joint. So in order to get to the back of the joint, it had to migrate through the cartilage surfaces. So this is actually a much worse chip. So the size of it is not really the the indicator, it's the location and the type of bone around it. So this is not a good case right here. A small piece that kind of over time was allowed to keep going and just crumbled it up and kind of ruined the joint. We really don't want to get to this point. It's unfortunate when we get sent films from Beyond the Wire and any of the other uh, organizations and they want us to take chips out then. At this point, taking the chip out doesn't change the outcome because the arthritis is already there. So it only makes the x-ray look better, but it really doesn't help the horse much at all. That's what we're trying to avoid. Remember that stress fractures in the knee are, are real entities. If the horse is, is sore, um, doesn't necessarily have joint effusion, but it's sore, it's lame. You take a skyline view here and you see this third carpal bone that's got sclerosis. So just like the sponge there, it's filled in with some brittle bone and it's getting a dark area in the front. Remember, those are subject to the one last race syndrome. That horse is trying to tell you it's, it's something's happening. It's sore. It's got radiographic changes. If you keep going, you end up getting a slab fracture, which then changes everything. That horse needs surgery. The prognosis is downgraded quite a bit. So getting a horse like this into the program on the left is a much better outcome. That bone can cool off and that horse can do anything. But when you end up progressing to a slab fracture, then you have to do surgery and the outcome is different. There's a lot more joint damage and lessens their opportunities. So remember that carpal slab fractures are stress fractures also. There's usually some kind of hint that something's coming on. I want to talk to you about shins because they really worry me <laughs> and everyone's had them, but um, you know, every horse has some form or another of shin problems. They, most of them get over it, but some will progress to a stress fracture and we do sometimes treat those surgically when they become complete fractures. Um, but they have a high risk for failure and they've got a pretty high recurrence rate even after surgery. So in the best case scenario, you might have a 20% recurrence rate but in a lot of the older horses where the bone gets more and more brittle, the recurrence rate is much higher. And so the question is, should they even be tagged, meaning monitored by uh, regulatory veterinarians? And I, I don't think that's actually really happening officially yet, but I can tell you it's probably on the radar. Um, so with HISA coming this July, and uh, I think you're gonna see more and more of that being an issue for shins. They're, uh, a bit dangerous as far as any other type of fracture that we see. I want to tell you a cautionary tale that really I carry with me to this day, but it's a, uh, it was a four-year-old thoroughbred, so already it's four years old, gets a shin fracture. You know it's had shin problems previously in its life. We fixed it, put some screws in, did all, everything right for the owner. Um, you know, he, he followed all the aftercare, everything, so proper layup, et cetera. So everything healed, took the screws back out, Ra went back and raced regularly for this owner for 16 months, which is actually pretty long. He's a four-year-old. A lot of those horses you know, have a pretty high recurrence rate at that age and last about six or seven races. But it, he, he sent me films and he said, the horse refractured his shin, what should I do? At this point, the horse is, I think, almost six years old. I said, well, you need to, don't need to do any surgery. You need to retire the horse. It it's a, was a big crack. He, I, unbeknownst to me, I thought he was gonna retire him to his farm. He dropped him in a claiming race. And I find out later, the horse raced three more times for different people, was claimed I think twice out of those three times, very low, had a precipitous drop in 
in class and then he had a fatal breakdown. Unfortunately, though, the, the rider was killed. So I never quite got over this one. This is what the horse's leg looked like because it was a post-mortem exam done at New Bolton Center. And it just shows you the, the energy that's involved in that kind of fracture. It's just, you know, tremendous. And so this is the right, a, a cross-section of the right cannon bone and it has a normal thickness. The left one here had multiple fractures. It wasn't just the one. So once they get bone that brittle, I think they're very dangerous. And um, just something to think about when you have a horse with a shin. You know, he, this particular owner, you know, put the horse in a claiming race, but the people that got the horse, you know, didn't necessarily know what was going on. And that's a, a big miss. So I think about it a lot, but I just wanted to share that with you, that it's not just the horse that loses. Like I said, a gentleman lost his life and, you know, racing lost a lot there. So there's a lot of diagnostic tools now readily available to you. This is a fantastic time, actually, to, to be in veterinary medicine because so much is available right at your fingertips. You have digital radiography. Does anyone remember when we used to have to go in the dark room and develop films? And you, know, you have your vet take films, and they'd say, OK, I'll see you in two hours, you know, get you the results. And you have a horse stand there with a fracture. So now you have instant. And not only that, the, your veterinarian takes pictures and then texts them to somebody else, a surgeon or my, you know, myself or my associate for some advice. So it's fantastic technology. So that's just radiographs. We have, of course, bone scans have been around for a long time. MRI now, we have computed tomography. We have even a robot version of computed, computed tomography. So you can get a CT done with a horse standing, never being anesthetized. We have a CT at our practice to use for fixing fractures so that we can do a better job figuring them out. And now there's PET scans, which is like a, a very high-tech way to determine um, bone activity that's pathologic in horses that are just sedated and standing. So they have that in place at Davis, and um, I believe they just got one at Rudin Riddle, too. So. so there's a lot going on to help you figure out what's going on with your horse before something bad happens. So remembering to remember to remind you that imaging is only an adjunct. It's not the be-all. So you commonly will see uh, someone say, oh, I have a horse that's lame left front, x-ray everything. You know, there's a lot more to it than that. There's the exam. So it's really important that your veterinarian that comes to the barn every day, knows what's going on in the barn, knows the horse, is giving you input as to whether there's a change, whether there's a clinical sign that, that shows you something. So it's a really great partnership to take advantage of. And also, it's really important that you allow your veterinarian to block the horse. A lot of veterinarians will call me wanting some help with the case, but says the trainer won't let them block the horse. It's such a great diagnostic tool, and it's extremely cheap. Just some carbocane to give you an idea where the pain is located, so you don't waste a ton of money and time trying to chase something up the leg when it's really the foot or something like that. So. The two of you working together is really your, your best um, starting point. And again, we want to avoid the one last race syndrome. So things that you catch early can give horses a great prognosis in many cases and you know, prolong their career. Um, we all win from that also because the breakdown rates decline. This is a, just an example here. This is a tibial stress fracture, that fuzzy part there. And that's just because we've gotten smarter at putting together the history, the clinical signs, imaging, to, to, to find out what's going on with the horse before it would actually break its leg on the racetrack. So uh, 20 years ago, tibial stress fractures were actually fractures that horses ended up dead on the racetrack because people didn't recognize there's a classic history with them. You know, there's a scenario that we commonly see. There's a clinical sign. There's a examination findings. And even before... Uh, you know, bone scans were popular for diagnosing it. Now we have other ways to diagnose it without even having to do a bone scan. So that saved a lot of horses just with the education factor. Another chronic issue just I think you should think about is bleeding, EIPH. You know, that's a really problematic area. Of course, with some of the new regulations coming in, we might even lose more horses, older horses that can't possibly compete with this problem. But they can do great in something else. And this is an easy test for you at the racetrack um, to help you figure out if your horse has really got chronic issues that's just not gonna come back. You know, a rest period's not gonna help you. There's no medication for that. 
But your veterinarian can actually take a lung x-ray in the shed row and tell you if there's, this is where they bleed from here. And when they become chronic cases, they make this typical scarring pattern that you can just figure out easily, cheaply, and decide, well, this is not economically going to be a good horse for me anymore. Time to move it on. And they can do a lot of great things. So even thinking of retiring horses that have chronic bleeding problems, a few simple tests on your part, you could figure that out, and they can go on and do lots of, lots of things. And they're not very economically viable for you, so it's not really helpful for you to have them in your barn. So how do you know when to retire your horse? That's always a good question. Um, of course, this is the obvious acute problem. You know, horse breaks its leg, gets a condylar fracture, whatever, makes, make a decision and move on. It's the chronic ones that are really tough to decide. Is this horse doing any good here? Is it, is it safe? Is it making any money you know, for, the, uh, for the owner? Is it competitive? So that's the ones that we're really trying to target to try to get before they're worthless, really, for anything else. The other thing to consider is sometimes horses aren't very good. <laughs> so anything that's just got no talent or desire can do great things somewhere else. In the end, it's better for you to just move that horse out of your barn and, and move on to the next one. So what are the options? Well, retirement to pasture sounds wonderful, but it's really a terrible option. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> There's just really very few places that is going to take a horse from you and let it live out its life just eating grass in the field. So we really are trying to get horses that are useful. So transitioning is really what you're after. And that's where you want to move your horse on to some other option where it can actually be useful and can provide a service. And thoroughbreds are excellent at that. A thoroughbred can do anything. There's a tremendous amount of um, money put forth now to, to shows every year. The, the Retired Racehorse Project, uh, New South Wales just put up a million dollars just in prize money for thoroughbred racehorses that become um, off the track competitors and they can show for a decent amount of money. So they can do anything. They can rain, they can jump, they can dressage, eventing, whatever it is they can do. They're extremely intelligent and very adaptable. So you're probably wondering, does this even apply to me? And I'll just tell you that very nicely, if you race in Maryland, it applies to you. Um, most states now have very strict laws about if your horse ends up in a bad situation in a slaughter pipeline somewhere, you could lose your ability to race and have a livelihood. You can lose your stalls, lose all your um, you know, options as far as being involved in the racing industry. So Maryland does have that in, in place, and most jurisdictions do now. So it behooves you to have something in mind about the aftercare issue. I don't want to, I want to underscore this power of social media. Some people's lives have been destroyed by social media just by being outed. And this is a real post from somebody that just kind of doxed the, um, you know, the owners and trainers of this particular horse. But if your horse ends up in a bad spot, it's going to reflect badly on you, period. So <clears throat> fortunately, we have some options for you. So Jessica's been working really hard with this Beyond the Wire. I think you've just done your 500th placement. So I don't know how long we've been working together. I don't know. It seems like a long time <laughs> but since you started. But, um, you know, they have this great program here in place that gives you an out. It protects you and your clients. It gives a horse a chance, and it prevents you from, from being liable for the horse ending up in a bad place. So they take horses from your barn and evaluate them, figure out if they need anything. Some don't need you know, anything done, but we have done some medical care for horses that need help before they can move on somewhere else. And it's a great, great program, and most tracks now are doing it. So it, it, it's a win-win for everybody. But you think you might know a good home, like you have a, a cousin who has a sister, who has a friend, who has a daughter, et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you in most cases that does not work out. At some point, your horse is going to end up somewhere and your name will be attached to it. So just be very, very careful about that. They need to have a place they're going to live for 25 years on average. So it's pretty hard to find a permanent home in that way. And unsound horses really have a tough time. 
You know, they just slip through the cracks. It's just inevitable. So use the resources available to, to you to protect both you and the horse. So what's next? So the conversation has finally become mainstream. Like I said, I started out with uh, these bake sale ladies, and now we have a tremendous amount of money that's put into the programs every year at, at all, the, all the tracks. So we have TCA, we have TAA, a lot of track groups. Um, there's a tremendous amount of rehoming, retraining groups that have popped up all over the country. And not just us, it's been other, other places as well. So now that that's become mainstream, it's part of the business plan of racing. All of us in it now are concentrating more on education and just letting people know what their options are, how to do things better, um, how to make this actually work. So I had a wish list that I made up like 20 years ago. And the number one thing was that there would be industry support of aftercare, and that's really happened. It's just tremendous. It was just on a bucket list for me, and now we have you know, millions of dollars applied every year. It's, it's uh, every race meet you go to, people are talking about it. Every track has something in place, um, so that's happened. So now there's a few more things we could probably do better, and one is like an equine social security, and that's sort of happening in some places also. Some sales companies are applying a surcharge when horses are sold to be given to uh, aftercare programs. There's some safety nets in place now. There's a, a group for standard breads called SOS, and they actually go to slaughterhouses and they pull out every single standard bread that they can find and track down the ownership and try to place these horses. So there's a lot more going on now behind the scenes. And then I think we really still need to do a better job of the claiming game and make some revisions there. We, we've talked before about proportional purse money to the value of the horse, but that's where you know a five claimer couldn't race for 20 or 30,000. And some, some places that's still happening and it just, the horse ends up losing there because it's a game of hot potato uh, to try to you know get the most out of the lemon until it's squeezed dry. So I think that there needs to be some work done in that. And I do think that the veterinary records somehow should go with the horse. We're probably going that way with the advent of microchipping and eventually we'll probably have a biometric, you know, markers with horses. But when horses change hands and you've seen some meets where horses will change hands every time they race, there's a real loss there with a, a lack of information that goes with the horse. There's repeating things that are done um, that are unnecessary and I mean, it just makes sense. More critical pre-race inspections, that's happening. In fact, we're getting um, more technological about it. You might have heard of the program in New York where they're trying to measure, um, they put a, a monitor in a saddle pad on some of the horses now and measure their stride length, acceleration, et cetera, and giving a very objective number as to how the horse, how comfortable it is. And then whether you know the next breeze has the same values or not, or if they've they've been elevated. So that's that's going that way. And then a transfer fee, which I think um, Naira's done a great job with. Every time a horse is claimed, there's no if ands buts about it. There's a fee that's paid into the aftercare fund, and if you don't pay the fee, you don't get the horse. I mean, they're very strict about it. No one's complained about it, but it's a percentage fee that goes with every horse that's claimed. So it's generated a lot of income for that program. And then just educational programs. I think a lot's happening. We have Horseman U. That's you know, a lot of um, information that's available to you to learn about some of these things. And um, there's a lot of opportunities now for horses. There's, like I said, there's, there's shows put on every year that are just for thoroughbreds. It gives them a lot of options. So it's made the show horse world very excited about getting a thoroughbred and doing something with it. So it used to be all warm bloods, and we've kind of uh, influxed them now with thoroughbreds, and it's worked out great. And again, we just want to try to do our best to recognize and avoid the one last race syndrome, a situation where the horse is just going to, ha has a chronic problem that is just getting worse and worse. It's not going to do well for you, and it's not going to do well for the horse in the end. Someday, I would like to see us change the way we train horses. I know this is controversial, but we know why buckshins occur. We know why stress fractures occur, but we still train horses the same way. So someday, we're going to lose that mentality, and we're going to get better at training horses so that we train a lot of those things away. I'll probably be put out of business, but that would be okay for me. Um, but we, we need to really look at that. 
So I would just end by saying that everyone in this room can offer one or more of these three things. So you may not have a lot of money, but you can offer some time, or you can offer a stall in your barn to a horse that needs to rehab for the Beyond the Wire program before it can move on. In our case, my practice, Dr. Curtis and I, we have a couple of skills. So we try to contribute our skills. So we all have something in our, our, our repertoire to contribute here to make this problem you know, work for all of us. It's like I said, if the horse wins, we all win in this game. And um, horse ownership is a responsibility, but it's also a privilege. We're lucky to be working with horses. And I know that we're you know, on the right track and we're going to do better. So that's it. I'll be happy to take any questions if anybody would like to discuss anything. Ah, yes. Oh. Yes. Yes, it was very young, a very, very um, well-managed barn. That was a Saratoga horse, very well-bred. But it just, you know, they're not all the same. There's some horses that are probably not going to have the same skeletal density that other horses do. And so we, we put them in the same training program. So over time, that's bone bruising at its, on steroids, you know. So it just c continued to... Um, create a brittleness in that area, and then the bone just wore away. So that's very, very rare to see that in a two-year-old. I mean, that was a shock, but it can happen. And I think we're seeing it more and more, and, and we do a lot of standard bred work too, and they're always, they've always been a hardier breed. They're not as hardy as they used to be. They don't have the big jughead Roman noses anymore. They're getting finer boned like thoroughbreds, and we're seeing more and more of the same type of stress-related injuries. So that's, that's you know, related to training. It's bone remodeling. Yes? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. He was a stallion for about 10 years, and then I recently saw that he went to old friends. So I don't think he did very well. I don't remember you know, hearing anything about the lameness characteristics, but he wasn't successful. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why he wasn't successful, but. I have, I have the microphone, so I'll ask a question. Oh, okay. Um, you noted on there that you'd like to see training done differently. Can you just make like a general statement of what you mean by that and what it would help? What? Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but about 25 years ago, there was a great research project done at Fairhill by a gentleman named Dr. Dave Nunnemaker, and he, he used a, a trainer, a friend of his named Dr. Fisher, who was a veterinarian. They figured out, completely figured out, why horses get buck shins, and it was related to the physics of how the cannon bone hits the ground with certain speeds. So basically, the gist of it was the bone becomes trained by what it's exposed to. So when it's exposed to jogging all the time, it becomes, for argument's sake, dense enough for jogging. But then when it's ready to breeze, it's not ready for the breezing, so it has to lay down some really cheap kind of bone like fiberboard to get ready for breezing. So it wasn't introduced to that kind of work. And then over time, leading up to galloping and um, you know, breezing and racing, they would get stress fractures or shin, buck shins in the cheap kind of bone that was laid down in a hurry. So I just, that whole concept is the same with all the stress remodeling that we see in ankles, cannon bones, shins, third carpal bones, um, you know, all of that is related. So I think that we just continue to train horses the same way as, as far as number of gallops, number of jog miles, then go to breezing. Like he made a simple point, Dr. Nunnemaker, that when you have your horse up fit galloping, just let it out the last furlong, you know, once or twice a week, 12 or 13 second furlong, so the bone gets the signal, I better be ready next time for some faster work, different physics of the way my leg hits the ground. So there's a, that's a simplified version of it, but that's part, partly of why what happens now with these um, bone bruising is those horses are trying to remodel the bone for what they're being asked to do, but they're not ready for the next step. They don't have the signal. There's a, actually an article online. If you Google Dr. Notamaker, you can actually look up his information and what he suggests for training, mm -hmm. you know, protocol, basically. Right. He does give a detailed, you know, week by week how you should train these horses. And when they train them that way, I think they had like a 98% rate of normal shins. Like, they did not get any buck shins. 
And it's the same process with the cannon bones and you know, third carpels and all. Uh, I was asked recently about rest, you know, as far as r running horses on short rest. And, uh, you know, I, d I don't know what to say about that from a scientific standpoint, because I don't have actual science behind it, but I think it's, it bears caution, you know, as far as r horses that do it tend to end up running in these short rest cases are tend to be the older claiming type horses. They're seasoned, maybe they don't have to train quite as hard. But I, I do think they have a different kind of bone in their skeleton and more susceptible to some injuries. So I don't know, that's something that probably needs some research. But it bears caution, I would say. Yes. Yeah, I got a question. With that training, is that on a consistent racetrack where you got the same consistency all the time? We run into problems mm -hmm. where you know, yeah. obviously when you get shins and stuff like that, it's usually when the track's really hard. Mm -hmm. You're hitting that concussion. Yeah. We've gone through, in the past year or so, tracks this deep, tracks like concrete, back and forth. And to me, that's just the worst thing you could do to a horse. Yeah, you bring up a good point. Absolutely, the consistency of the, the track. Race track. Yeah. Consistency. Yes, and I was mentioning that earlier about the problems we've had with tracks leading to you know opportunity for vulnerable horses but yes it was at it was at the Fairhill training center they did that it was a very consistent i think it was uh tapita surface so yes it was yeah that's difficult mm -hmm. yes that's absolutely a factor yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's a, definitely so a problem. It's kinda, it just makes some of those statements just not accurate as far as mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I do. No, I, I mean, in a perfect world, <laughs> talking about. But yes, there's definitely, you know, we had one year at Aqueduct, uh, I think it was 2012. It was an incredible amount of horses with a freeze thaw cycle that just horrible time uh, with injuries and deaths. I think it was 22 or so breakdowns in a short meet. So I mean, we've been going through this here. Yes. As you probably heard, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, the track just has not been consistent mm -hmm. for a while. Well, it puts you in a tough spot for sure. Yeah. And vulnerable horses, more vulnerable. So it's hard to make like a training schedule to change our training, you know, when the track yeah, I mean, what I'm talking about is more of a philosophy of training. It's not just, you know, that easy, but it's just, I think the industry over time is going to change a little bit about how they train horses, with the more that we find out scientifically. Yes. Um, I, my question is, uh, when a horse develops like a, a bone spur, which basically he's not lame or anything, but he perhaps carries a little bit of heat and a little bit of inflammation and then you x-ray it, you see that. What's your opinion as far as how to basically move forward with something like that? Usually the bone spur is a sign that that joint's having some issues. It's got inflammation. I, I mean, I used to get x-rays sent to me to have remove the bone spur, but that doesn't change anything. It's just a sign of something that's happening. So it, it just depends if you're talking about a knee or an ankle an ankle. So you're just getting some arthritis in the ankle and all other films are normal of the ankle. It's just a spur like on the corner. So the, that horse is just like you and I, you know, we have over time have areas that we concentrate on more with our gait and that horse is putting stress on a certain location that the bone reacts by just shoring itself up. So you obviously have, you know, some stress or strain on that particular ankle. So I, I couldn't say what you should do for your particular horse, but it's just a sign for you that, yeah, and there might be a reason why it's happening there relative to the opposite other front leg or the contralateral hind leg, something, age, <laughs> you know. Sure. Hey, Anybody Dr. Else? Hogan, thanks for coming um, out today. Hi. Always good having you. I had a question, and I don't know if it's a bit of fake news. I was talking to someone a couple days ago. Um, most breakdowns happen after the break, 
Is that a, a thing? Or do you know a time when these breakdowns happen? I mean, you get these horses and you have to do surgery. Do you guys keep data on maybe when the horse possibly broke down? You mean when the track is harrowed? Um, yeah, maybe yeah. that. But I, someone said something to me the other day, and it made me think about it. They were like, most breakdowns happen first after. And I don't know if it was correct or not, but mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have an opinion on that. And if no, not at all. I actually don't know. I don't know. I, I probably not there enough, you know, to be on the scene to know the, the timing. I never get that part of the equation. I only get the It'd horse breezed or something. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure somebody has looked at that in some of those studies. Anybody else? Could you do us a favor? Um, somebody just asked, could you spell Dr. Nunnemaker's last name in case anybody sure. want to look, wants to look that up? Yep, Dave Nunnemaker, N-U-N-A-M-A-K-E-R, Nunnemaker. He was at New Bolton Center. He's retired now, but that was pretty groundbreaking work he did a long time ago. Anybody else? All right, well, I'd like to thank Dr. Hogan so much <laughs> thank for <you. laughs> coming and giving us this presentation. Um, I also want to acknowledge Dr. Alex Curtis over here. Mm -hmm. She works with Dr. Hogan and she does a lot of the surgeries for Beyond the Wire. Um, so Dr. Hogan's practice is very good to us, so we really appreciate it and thank her for that. Um, there's gonna be lunch again out here, and uh, so you know, help yourself, and Dr. Hogan and Dr. Curtis will be around if anyone has any further questions. And thank you all so much for coming. I, I think yes, thank events you. like this are really important. Mm -hmm. Thanks.